Welcome to the Tech Today podcast powered by CEO Raider. It's your host, John Maeda. Check us out online at CEORaider.com where you may anonymously rate and review your CEO. And visit techtoday.com, T-E-K, number two day for the latest in capital markets and technology-related news. We have an article coming out tomorrow morning entitled, Long Rates Continue to Climb as Inflation Persists. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here in the famous words of Frank Drebin, for those of you who know the Naked Gun film series. So the Fed would have us believe that there's nothing to see here as it relates to inflation, when clearly there is inflation in every corner of the economy. So many investors, institutional investors, are excited about the the retail growth that was reported this morning, believing that it suggests that the economy is strong and, and rebounding. And in short, I will be bullish on the economy when you start to see spending increases that are a result of increased productivity, as opposed to spending increases that are a result of debt funded government quote-unquote stimulus checks. Handouts are inferior to productivity. And what you see now is is people spending government handout checks. So retail sales, retail and food services sales are up 5.3% sequentially in January over December. And by the way, that 5.3%, you can't tease out of that government reported figure how much of the 5.3% increase was due to unit sales increases and how much was due to price increases. So it's just sort of an aggregate blended figure, if you will. But it's difficult to get excited for me for that uptick, given that you know the source is a government handout, a debt-funded government handout, no less. It's not as though the government has the money to hand out. We're printing these stimulus checks. You know, this is the last of the Trump stimulus. Then we have the $1.9 trillion coming from Biden. Then we probably have another $1 to $2 trillion coming from Biden at the end of 2021 or early 2022 that's supposed to fund his uh, green infrastructure projects. So it's difficult to get excited about any spending increases that are a function of debt increases, of expanded government deficits, all enabled by increased money printing, i.e. inflation, all in the face of lower labor participation rates. You know, labor participation rate in January ticked down modestly from December. The labor participation rate is well below what it was in 2009, 2010 during that financial crisis. If you remember the financial crisis, if you were around for that and working in the markets, it was very similar to March of 2020 when the debt markets froze before the the Fed's pumped in two plus trillion into the economy. So if you remember when the credit markets froze a year ago, that's what 09 was like. And the Fed at the time kind of came to the to the rescue and they pumped in what was the initial amount, 800 billion, bailed out some banks. But in the process, there were a number of bankruptcies and it took a while to grow out of that, that trough. And that's of course, that 08, 09 timeframe, that is of course when the Fed instituted quantitative easing quantitative easing, which is supposed to be a one-off. And of course, now it's, you know, it's here permanently. So until we see that labor participation rate start to climb, I'm negative on the economy. I'm negative on it. You know, we have neighbor, labor participation declining consistently over time. The data that we link to in the article goes back to, to 2000. And so we're at our lowest point. And, and what are we doing? Instead of tightening our belt, we're printing money, handing out checks. Universal basic income is here. You know, it's here in the form of stimulus checks, and now you have Mitt Romney and some of the liberal Republicans talking about child tax credits, which is a form of UBI. And I'm all for tax breaks. I think I've said in this podcast before, I'd love to see a repeal of the income tax, and then you replace it with the, with the, with the sales tax so that we get taxed on uh, discretionary purchases, as opposed to uh, the federal government and state government taking it off of the top. But that's a conversation for another, another day. So let's, let's go through some of the bullet points in the article. So I already took off. I already ticked off the, the the first bullet as to why I'm not bullish on the 5.3 percent sales increase. Not bullish in the way that many institutional investors are. And by the way, I'd be bullish about the the equity market given all the liquidity that's that's coming down the pipeline. But I'm not bullish on the economy as many investors are. You know, I touched on these child tax credits, which we linked to in the article. If you want to read up on that. So Americans can spend all they want as it relates to 
these government quote unquote stimulus checks, but that's just left pocket, right pocket. Government prints it, people spend it. It, it. It's not as though people are spending savings generated from increases in productivity, whether it's productivity that's a function of sole person, entrepreneurial endeavors or small businesses or, or large companies. Productivity hasn't, hasn't ticked up. We still have a, a weak economy as evidenced by debt expanding as a function of GDP. We linked to some of that detail in the article. We're roughly at 127% debt to GDP at the moment. The, the CBOE talks about the federal debt may reach and exceed 180% of, 180% of GDP by the year 2050. Well, at the current rate, we're going to blow through that estimate. And that's not a good thing. Trade deficits with China. How does that not expand? How does that not expand on, under Biden, given his dovish view of, of China? So we'll continue to ship production there. My guess is over time, we will be on, on China's 5G standard. Huawei will be back. Huawei will become the largest handset manufacturer by a wide margin over time. The myth that inflation doesn't exist. Well, the truth is debt funded, because it's debt funded inflation, persists across the economy. You know, whether it's home prices, lumber prices, gas prices, equities, speculative in in instruments such as Bitcoin, and we link to the various indices in the in our article. But everything's been straight up, right, since since April of 2020. So how is there not inflation? The Fed, of course, is referring to the narrow basket of goods, their CPI basket, but that does not reflect economic reality. And the long rates reflect this uncertainty, right? Boom times, as I said at the beginning, this quote-unquote boom time economy that I'm reading about in newspaper articles that institutional investors talk about, these boom times are enabled by record debt levels. And spending that's enabled by record debt levels in the face of low labor participation, record low labor participation, mind you, 100% unsustainable. And the, 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 the Fed can't print in perpetuity, right? They can't ramp up QE continue to subsidize fiscal deficits in perpetuity and not have the dollar tank. So if they want to protect the dollar, that means interest rates are going up. If they want to maintain interest rates across the various, uh, across the duration spectrum, that means they're going to continue to have to print and print at an accelerated rate, which is going to hurt the dollar. So something's going to give, and at some point, the Fed's going to have to pull back on this printing mania because it's unsustainable. And that, of course, is reflected in the long rates, which are up 12% month to date on the on the 30 year. So how do you get a strong economy? We've talked about this before. I've written about it before on a number of occasions. But if you're a government and you want to stick your hand in the economy, my recommendation would be rather than printing money and handing out checks to those that have been displaced, it would be to train people. So have a public-private partnership with some of the largest technology companies, small technology companies. Uh, the technology, obviously, far and away is the fastest growing sector of the economy, particularly as technology bleeds into different industry verticals. Right? The way I think about technology is every company is a technology company. Every company should be adopting technology. So train people to be software engineers. Train people to be software developers, data scientists. Engineers and developers in particular are a scarce resource. And that's why the large tech companies want to import qualified labor from countries like India and elsewhere, skilled labor. Right? These aren't call center employees that Microsoft and others want to bring in from elsewhere. This is skilled labor, engineers, because the level of supply here in the U.S. is low. So we need to train skilled labor. In addition to engineers, developers, architects, I think manufacturing is key. Right, manufacturing is key, as we've written about at, at Tech Today. You know, innovation does not come from the C-suite. The people who are innovating are the people on the front lines, whether they're manufacturing cars or manufacturing phones. And we've outsourced a lot of that production. You know, cars down to Mexico, phones to to China. And I'd argue some of the best phones on the market are, are Chinese phones. And where's the labor? Where's the manufacturing labor? It's it's in China. So I would certainly incent, if I were king for a day, incent companies to move production here. And it's not just to keep, uh, keep, uh, keep employment healthy. But if you want these companies to innovate, you know, the innovation, again, it's going to happen on the front line. So if you want these companies to, you know, continuously produce superior products over time, you want that manufacturing to be in the United States. 
Otherwise, the innovation engine is going to get hollowed out, right? I mean, and, and what's the U.S.? So if you're Apple, as an example, and I know they're shifting some production to, to Austin, but let's say, let's just put forth a hypothetical. If you're Apple and you wanted to move all iPhone, iPad, Mac production, assembly, you name it, all the production elsewhere, whether it's China, Southeast Asia, let's just say it's you know, outside of the United States. Well, wherever that production is going, ultimately, those are the people, those people on the ground. Those are the people who are going to innovate because they're handling the product each and every day. And they're the ones that are going to say to themselves, is a better way to do this, whether it's a better way to, a better and more efficient way to assemble the product or a better way to uh, design the product, right? Given that they're handling the product each and every day, uh, they're, they're likely to be the first ones to identify design flaws. And those people on the front line ultimately will, will leave and start their own firms. I mean, that, that's why uh, Silicon Valley was a growth engine in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, where you'd have, uh, for example, a software engineer who would uh, be with a, you know, a growing company, get in early, have a variety, a variety of responsibilities, you know, first as an individual contributor, maybe as then as a, as a team leader and so forth. He or she would learn the product really well, identify a, a, a better way to uh, build the product or, or think of a, 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 a better product, leave that company with his or her small team and, and, and start a competitor. And so you had this innovation engine where people would, you know, leave, leave their employer to, 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 to start a new company. That, that was sort of the culture. And it still is to a degree, but I feel like it's, it's less about innovation today as compared to 20 years ago and more about, um, you know, quickly scaling up valuations. So venture guys throwing tons of capital at the quote unquote leading companies in their portfolio in an effort to goose sales at the expense of building the infrastructure required to support those sales. And the purpose of goosing sales is to goose the valuation of those companies regardless of whether those companies are delivering the, the best products and services possible. And it's a game of musical cheers today. Very different than when I started to go to the Valley, which was just after the dot-com boom, uh, right, right after the bust, rather, back in kind of 03, 04. And so I'll, I'll leave you with the sentiment that I've shared a number of times before. Until we get off this debt-funded gravy train and focus on that which is important and sustainable, which is to say production, then none of this boom time economy will in fact be sustainable. That's all for now. See you next time.